in recommendations, meaning that you must be monitoring, you must advise, you must monitor for the adverse effects of these medications. They're not B9 medications. Cannabis is not a B9 medication, but certainly these are not in particular the antipsychotics. So not a lot of options. And while these can be useful for many of our patients, for many others, they're limited either because they're not uh, effective or they are cause, cause significant adverse effects. So there are a whole bunch of other recommendations. And among these is THC, um, which is the, the main, or let's say a main, uh, the main active ingredient uh, in cannabis, uh, 9 delta tetrahydrocannabinol. And it's specifically for adults. It's a level C recommendation, meaning that that may be considered, and I'll get into more details around that later on, and the, um, with a low confidence in terms of the evidence level. All right, where did this start um, for me? I, as I mentioned, this is something that really was driven by patients. Indeed, this was the case. This was my introduction to this, was I was just completed my clinical training. This was around 12 years ago. Uh, that I saw my first patient specifically, this was the reason for referral. Re reason for referral, cannabis for kids. Um, this was an 18 year old patient. So a very young adult, uh, in fact, had been followed by a very competent child adolescent psychiatrist who while was not an expert in Tourette syndrome, had decent experience and had treated this patient uh, very appropriately uh, throughout um, her, uh, her youth. And what happened was this patient had been to a party, the joint being passed around, she smokes up a bit, and then when she goes home, her family says, well, you're not thinking, what's going on? And then quickly put two and two together and realize it wasn't that. So, uh, so she, he, the, her, her psychiatrist, or first of all, he was a child adolescent psychiatrist that didn't continue following her once she became an adult, uh, but also he referred her to our specialized clinic specifically with this question uh, in terms of using cannabis for tics. I had never used cannabis for tics or anything else for that matter. I knew very little about using cannabis clinically. And uh, I knew a little bit about a couple of studies that were out there and she came in specifically for that reason. So I talked about how limited the evidence was. I was warning her about the, the risks. And then she stopped me. She said, listen, I've gained 50 pounds on Resperidone. I've slept through high school on Pony. This is working for me. Don't give me your, you know, risks and such. And, and you know, and go. So, so I had no choice, I felt. And I, I really, uh, it made sense what she was saying. And I really got into this. So basically, I had to figure out the bureaucratic process, which was quite different back then compared to today. Things have changed a lot, and I'll go over that as well. And that's how I started getting into this. And it's been fascinating. Um, so in the beginning, I, I would, after this patient, you know, when you start seeing routinely, you hear patients talking about cannabis having health benefits. And really, we're talking, this is early days. This is not in recent years, but a lot of high crop cannabis. But at the time, really, a lot of it was serendipitous, where Again, people have no idea, they're just at a party, cannabis is being used, and they just realize that after smoking, the, the ticks have gone down. And so, and, and this would be, you know, I'd be asking what makes the ticks worse, what makes the ticks better, and that's how the history would come. And so I would start, I began to, to very tentatively, gradually offer cannabis for patients who had failed multiple treatments, so whether the, the antipsychotics, alpha 2 agonist, uh, behavioral therapy. And I was often very struck by the response. And so increasingly, I've started using it more and more. And that's basically how we got into this. So a little bit about the history. And this is, the, the history is interesting and, and actually relevant. Now I'm focusing here on Canada, because that's where I'm based. Um, and you guys are from all over the world, and I think most of you are from the US and from all over the country. So in different places, different countries, different states, there's gonna be different uh, 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 processes in terms of how things develop. 
Uh, but it's interesting because really it has influenced what we can do, both research and clinical, and how we've gone about doing things. So starting in, in uh, so coming back to Canada, so cannabis was criminalized, actually, I just uh, realized 100 years ago now, uh, to the year, uh, so cannabis was criminalized in Canada. And for most of the past century, really, it was, uh, um, this was the case up until 2001, when the use of medical cannabis became legal uh, with the medical marijuana access regulations. And this was a result of litigation uh, uh, by two patients who had, for whom had, uh, had some benefit. And this was, this was five years after medical cannabis was legal in California, which was the first state to legalize medical cannabis. And then some, and, and by the way, in 2001, up until 2013, not much changed. To access medical cannabis, you had to go through, all, there was only one point of entry, which was Health Canada, and you had to submit an application, and there was only one product available, which was a dried or 12% THC, I remember. And when I started you, um, uh, this process with that young patient that, uh, that I mentioned early on, this was around 2010. So this was very much during that time. It was a much simpler, there were more limited options, but things were much simpler. Health Canada wanted to get out of that business. And what, and, and what they did is instead of being the sole point of entry for cannabis, um, what they did is they began licensing producers. So there was a change, a significant change in 2013, where, they, uh, where you have an explosion in different companies uh, to, that applied to Health Canada to become licensed producers. So they were referred to as LPs or medical cannabis. Again, we're talking medical cannabis. And then there was a plethora of options, an explosion of different options. So now we had dozens of companies and each with many, many products they were offering. And now we were not just talking about THC, we were talking about CBD, different levels of each, different kinds of plants and different names, black diamond, black kush, it became very, or a purple kush, I think it was very confusing. And so there was an explosion of options. And now instead of applying to Health Canada, you were submitting something to one of those companies and was a very quick, straightforward process. And then you could just buy the product from the company directly. In 2015, the definition of medical cannabis expanded. And now it included cannabis oil and fresh buds. So before it was still dried herb and the only legal thing you could do it with it was inhale it, but it was smoking it, vaporizing it. Um, and for a lot of patients, this was not something they wanted to do um, they, for various reasons. They wanted to be able to take it orally, but this was not available until 2015. Um, and then the big event happened in 2018 was cannabis became completely legal in Canada for recreational, use. I say completely legal, it is regulated similar to alcohol, but in a different way. And um, so now things change a lot now because now we, patients don't even need to come to us, right? I you could say they never needed to come to us. It's so available in the black market. But anyhow, legally it became recreational. And, um, and so that also has changed things and uh, quite a bit. And uh, we'll, I'll touch on that later on. And, it, uh, and then in um, a year later, um, other the, the uh, other things like right, such so as cannabis edibles, topicals, concentrates became legal as well. Although I have the asterisk here, is there's a lot of variation across the provinces in terms of what's available and how it's regulated. So Quebec, the province of Quebec, which is uh, it, that's where things are most tightly regulated. There's only one single supplier, which is the province, and there are a lot of things that are not available, like gummies, candy, can, you know, these kinds of edibles are just not available in Quebec. Whereas another, on the other end of the spectrum is the province of Ontario, where I am located, where you have an explosion of cannabis stores selling all sorts of things, including canna, uh, gummies and all sorts of things. I am not exaggerating when I say that from my house within a 10 minute walk, I can get to 10 different cannabis stores. It's really an explosion. I don't know how they survive, but there's such a market for them. Um, but anyhow, point is that there's a lot of variation in Canada. Okay, and with this explosion, there's also been an explosion of different medical cannabis clinics selling cannabis for everything. And 
I get all sorts of flyers, either from the companies themselves advertising their products for different, all sorts of different things, um, or from medical cannabis clinics. And it's really very striking. Like, look at this one, commonly treated conditions, uh, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, depression, insomnia, stress, panic disorder, bipolar, borderline personality disorder. It is very striking. Maybe what's they can add to the list, uh, peace in the Middle East, world famine and whatnot. So it is really, when you start seeing something advertised so widely and marketed so widely as a, as a, as a panacea for everything, I think it does warrant skepticism and it warrants caution and concern in terms of um, what's happening. I mean, people are very aware that we have an opioid epidemic, uh, in particular in North America, and it started by these specialized clinics marketing opioids uh, very aggressively. And so I think caution is certainly warranted in how we proceed with this. And this is the title of an article, uh, why we need to press pause on any kind of cannabis promotion. Many companies are selling marijuana as if the drug is totally harmless. It's not. This is written by Ruth Ross, who's the chair of the Department of Pharmacology here in Toronto at the University of Toronto. And um, she is, this is her area of interest. It's, it's cannabis in particular, CBD, cannabidiol, this is her area of expertise. All right. Starting with some basics here, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page and oriented with some very basic terms here. So I mentioned THC. Um, what is THC? Uh, um, delta 9 uh, delta avenol. It's a partial agonist, agonist to CB1 and CB2 receptors. Uh, these are uh, receptors that are in particular the CB1 receptors that are very um, uh, uh, prevalent throughout the nervous system. And they're quite rich in the basal ganglia in particular. Um, and then what about C, and, and I have to say these receptor, they were not created for the purpose of THC, who knows, evolutionarily, but there is an endocannabinoid system. Okay? There's a whole very elaborate endocannabinoid system that is something we're still learning about. And two in particular, and, uh, uh, endocannabinoid compounds are anandamide and, uh, and 2-AG. And uh, so, uh, and those are uh, compounds that are active on these receptors, okay? And then CBD is a cannabidiol. It's a negative allosteric modulator of these receptors. Basically, it decreases the effect of THC through these receptors. But it's not just these two. These two are what get the most attention. And <clears throat> most products you buy will tell you how much THC and how much CBD there are in them. However, there are hundreds of other compounds. And then there are the so-called terpenes that give the, the particular odor uh, to the cannabis. And what, what I want to say is, and people talk about um, the milieu effect or how that, that uh, the effect of THC might be not just on THC itself, but it might be in the presence of these other things. Um, and so it's, it's very complex. You see studies uh, about you know, cannabis or THC effects at different conditions and how it changes in very different ways depending on the ratio of CBD. So it's all this to say, it's quite complex. It's very early days, um, but uh, it's, uh, this is basically, the, the, these are the basics of, of, uh, of the cannabis compounds at this point. What about the products themselves? So what is available? What are the options? Uh, also lots of options available, uh, but broadly it, the, there are three different ways uh, cannabis can be used. There are the pharmaceuticals, there's inhaled cannabis, and there's oral cannabis. So in terms of the pharmaceuticals, there's navalone, which is a synthetic uh, partial agonist to CBR1, CBR2. Um, so it's basically a synthetic compound. And then you have dronabinol, which is THC essentially, but it's, it's made synthetically, but it's THC. Uh, so these are both pills. You have nabiximols, which is a spray, the brand name Sativax, and it's, it's an oral mucosal spray that is, has both THC and CBD in it, in equal ratio, roughly. And then you have cannabidiol, which is um, uh, just CBD, basically, and it's, it's its own product that's it's licensed by the FDA, Epidiolex is a brand name, for rare forms of epilepsy, uh, Gravet syndrome, lennox gastaut syndrome, and <clears throat> Uh, and it's, it's amazing to see, by the way, I'll say 
like because of the i mean it's it's in some patients who have had uh, resistance and have had severe uh, epilepsy uh, that has not uh, responded to treatment this has been miraculous but because of the headlines people start getting the thought that this oh this is good and so i've seen you know it's amazing how things change in, in just a few years i've seen patients where the parents give them like 10 drops of CBD oil because of some concept that is kind of good for you. And so caution against that. And then cannabis can be inhaled either by smoking or by vaporizing or by vaping, especially vaping has been a very uh, popular recently. Uh, I would say of the three, vaporizing is probably the least harmful, but none of these is completely benign. Uh, vaporizing is, is, is basically where the, the, the herb is, is heated up, basically, and, uh, and so then the compound just va it's vaporizing. You know, vaping is, is the, the compounds are are, uh, are concentrated in, in some liquid that's in a cartridge. And then uh, cannabis can be used orally, either the oils, which have lots of these days, the capsules, or the so-called edibles, chocolate, cookies, gummies, and stuff. All right, and what are the effects? So in terms of the benefits, uh, cannabis is used often as an anti-emetic, and there's there's recent evidence of it as anti-emetic, um, uh, and appetite stimulation, and AIDS, and, and, and uh, chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, it helps with pain, not all pain, but in certain uh, uh, kinds of pain, it can be helpful. An antispastic and multiple sclerosis, an anti-seizure, that's specifically CBD, and specifically in a certain form of epilepsy. So that's the list of benefits so far where I think there's decent enough evidence. But what about the list of harms? Like many things, the list of harms is, is long and it's, and it's worth being aware of. That's what's important to be aware of. So you have lots of things, dizziness, sedation is common, fatigue, psychomotor slowing, the feeling of high, and I put it here under the heart because you know, when people go to a party and they want to get high, that's very different than using it daily to treat something. People don't want to get high, so it's really a, an adverse effect. Uh, a, a motivation can have negative mood effects, depression, anxiety, irritability. Um, and these are things, again, these are things we see clinically, you know, not just theoretical. Um, experiencing derealization, personal, depersonalization, altered perception. Psychosis is particularly a concern in young people, especially below the age of 16, but I, I have seen it. It can certainly happen in adults, and I have seen it in adults, so these people who are uh, with cannabis profits, dry mouth and red eyes. With their okay, so what about for ticks? What are the effects of ticks, and what is the evidence? To speed up a little bit. Um, so first, starting with case series, and, and and, and there's this, the highly cited study by uh, Kirsten muller Wall from Hanover, Germany, who really has been a pioneer in this area. And uh, um, she, what she, she noticed, similar to us, patients describing uh, positive effects of, uh, of uh, cannabis for their ticks. And she went and asked a series of patients, like 60 something patients, if they've ever uh, tried cannabis or if they've ever used cannabis and, uh, and what impact it had on their ticks. And out of the 17 patients that had used cannabis, 14 reported that um, it had uh, decreased their ticks and relapses. 14 out of 17 pretty fast. We did a retrospective study ourselves in, in our patients who had been using cannabis, and we found of the seven, 17 out of the 18 patients had were very much or much improved in terms of their ticks and other symptoms as well. So uh, the, the, the hope in that study was to understand a little bit more how patients were using it and see what we could learn from it, but there's a lot of variation in how people were using the, the product. Um, a group in Israel uh, looked at patients who had gotten um, licenses from the Ministry of Health uh, for using cannabis uh, for uh, in Tourette's syndrome. And uh, they looked specifically at I can't remember with patients have been using for six months or at least a year. Uh, so again, like all the other samples, didn't include everyone. Uh, it, the patients who continue to use it, um, but uh, or who had used it for a certain period of time, rather. And so, 38 out of the 40 didn't report any kind of benefit. But in terms of the adverse effect, and uh, by the way, a lot of our patients experience adverse effects, but 
generally what was they were tolerable and relatively mild. But and and it's here it was striking where four of their patients reported hallucinations, six irritability and confusion, seven cognitive decline, and one out of the uh, 42 acute uh, uh, psychotic episode. And 10 of the 42 stopped after a year. So it's uh, again not 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 exactly a benign drug. Uh, uh, Kirsten's group uh, from Germany uh, interviewed 98 patients, and one interesting finding they had was that it was a preference for THC-rich medical cannabis over um, over things that were less THC, more CBD, or over what's interesting, over other forms like the pharmaceuticals. And I have to say, this was our experience as well. While we do use the pharmaceutical cannabis. Uh, cannabinoids, I should say, like cannabinoids. Marinol is no longer available for cannabis. It uses uh, use cannabis smalls as well. And, um, uh, so, uh, but definitely people prefer the THC based uh, actual cannabis. And then, very fresh, just from last week, uh, this paper was published just last week, uh, again from a group in Tel Aviv and Israel 25 patients, 75%. Uh, experience reduction, uh, so, sorry, 75% reduction in symptoms, so pretty substantial reduction in symptoms. Again, similar to what others have seen. And the other thing that's interesting that they report is that over the years, there was an increase in the amount of cannabis that they were using. So uh, that to have the same effect, there was an increase in the amount. Of uh, all the cases that have been uh, reported in this case series, uh, which is probably a little under 200, uh, there were only seven cases in age group. Okay, so this is really mostly an adult study. What about the clinical trials? So the case series, the, the effects, if you see, are pretty substantial. When it comes to the clinical trials, the, the effects are a little bit uh, less impressive. So uh, starting again with Kirsten muller Paul and the single dose crossover RCT of oral THC versus placebo, Looking at, using, looking at the Tourette syndrome symptom list, there's a 14 point reduction in that relative five point reduction. Okay, it was single dose. She, she went on to carry out a parallel design study with 24 adults, six weeks, again, THC versus placebo. And overall, the effect was statistically significant, but it wasn't consistent. It wasn't consistently the case. Um, maybe the size, but again, not as impressive as we, we look at the case series. Um, and then um, the Michael Block uh, from Yale uh, did a study looking at, uh, this was an open label study where these were double blind RCTs. This was an open label study, uh, there was no control. And looking at THC with palmitoyl ethanolamide, okay, the idea that it would have more the, the milieu effect that uh, people talk about. Um, and there was a 20% improvement in the YGTSS uh, total fix score. Again, not as impressive, and it's open, and despite it being open, I don't know how this would survive a double blind randomized control design. And then Kirsten published more recently did another study, and this one is not with cannabis, not actual cannabis, it's a cannabinoid or something that affects the cannab cannabinoid system, monoacyl glycerol lipase inhibitor. So it's an inhibitor of the enzyme MAG, which uh, breaks down the endocannabinoids, the TA 2AG in particular. Um, and, uh, and, and so what they found was there was a statistical a significant effect in favor of the placebo. So really, you know, this is not cannabis, mind you, and really it maybe it was more theoretical than anything else, the idea that if you were to decrease the breakdown of the endocannabinoid, you would have more endocannabinoid. But that didn't work. And then uh, also recently, uh, there was... Uh, uh, study again from the Tel Aviv group, 18 adults, 12 week open label study. There was a 38% improvement in white PSS, but again, I emphasize sort of uncontrollable. So that's pretty much it, or the main thing of the evidence until the study that I'll get into in a, in a sec. But basically, there's no been no study of uh, with actual, uh, no RCT, I should say, or randomized controlled trial with actual um, cannabis and no trial comparing THC to CBD, which to me, I have to say, it's, it's been striking for me to see how many patients who are interested in CBD want to use CBD, um, 
because of how much attention it was getting. So this is basically what we did. And so we did this cannabis randomized control trial where we looked at the efficacy and tolerability of three vaporized medical cannabis products for kids. Um, our primary efficacy endpoint were the modified rush video take rating scale, the MRPTRS. This, our secondary efficacy endpoints were the pre-monetary urge for tick scale, the subjective units of distress scale, and the clinical global impression or improvement scale. We also correlated the symptoms with cannabinoid plasma levels, and we were interested in tolerability. <laughs> what were the three products that we're talking about? So basically, THC, THC in combo with CBD, just CBD, and placebo, which is basically cannabis with a THC and CBD extracted below detectable levels. <clears throat> Everyone got the same thing. This was 0.25 grams of cannabis herb that was vaporized with that process. <clears throat> what was the design? Everyone got in under double blind randomized control uh, conditions. We would get a single dose for one product. Two weeks later, we get a single dose of the other product. Two weeks later, third product. Two weeks later, fourth product. And they had blood levels and assessments done just at baseline before they got their dose, and half an hour after they got their dose, and one, two, three, and five hours after, where these things were measured, and then blood was sampled for THC, as well as its metabolites, uh, hydroxy THC, which is actually the main active metabolite of THC, very potent. Uh, um, uh, metabolite, and then carboxy THC, which is inactive, and then uh, CBD. In terms of the analysis, it was a nonlinear mixed effects modeling, and nonlinear because that goes up and up down. So repeated measures, the same participants had the same product uh, at different times, but it was adjusted for baseline score and treatment order effects. Um, and then there was correlation with uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoid plasma levels and everything was tested for that. So we screened 68 participants who were contacted us interested in inquiring uh, about the study, interested in our final body study at 17 methods, which are criteria. So a lot were excluded. Um, and this is where it gets interesting. The main reason for exclusion, there were various reasons, but the main was a lot of patients were already using it and were not willing to give it up for the purpose of the study. Even the temporary, a lot of the thought it would be getting a street cannabis during the study until they realized it was just a single dose study, two weeks apart, and they'd have to be off that. So, um, <clears throat> 17 met in inclusion criteria, five were withdrawn uh, for various reasons, and then 12 were randomized. So, who are the 12 patients that were randomized? 11 males. Uh, there was a lot of comorbidity with what, as you expect, uh, OCD, uh, seven had OCD, six had ADHD. Uh, the YGTSS, the average, uh, was uh, 28.7, the total good score, range 15 to 44. Uh, seven of the average taking values different compared to medications. And then three of the 12 had classic most of them. <clears throat> there were three dropouts. Um, one due to an adverse event, specifically was I had put here syncope slash seizure. The patient lost consciousness for about five seconds. It was very brief. There was some shaking, not entirely clear. It was just some myoclonic jerking in the past of syncope or if it was actual seizure. The patient was perfectly fine after that point. Down. One, the difficulty with drawing the blood, and then one dropped off the uh, schedule. All right, what, are, what were our findings? So this is a bit of a busy graph, but don't worry, I'll walk you through it. Uh, so the, here, this was our primary uh, efficacy endpoint, the MRVPRS, if you'll recall, and the turquoise line here is THC. And you see, and the red one is placebo. You see, it looks like there's a tendency here right after taking it, um, but really it was not statistically significant. From placebo and the others, it's not at all. Good. This was our primary efficacy. In terms of the POTS, the pre monetary earth per tick scale, this is what you see with the THC. Significant drop that persists before gradually coming back up, and only for the THC. And then, same for the subjective units of the stress, the subscale. Significant drop for the THC, not the other. 
With the CGI, there was a general tendency for improvement right after taking the, the, the cannabis um, in all arms, including a little bit in the placebo, but only the THC one uh, survives its uh, uh, statistical significance. These are the plasma levels. I won't spend too much time on it, just to point out that we, we saw what we expected to see in the different products. So for example, the turquoise, which is THC, you see uh, increases in THC and metabolites, but you don't see any uh, CBD in it, you see here. And the peaks are very early, okay? And before they trend back down, and there's some variability, which allowed us to do correlations. And then the CBD product, for example, you only see it uh, go up in the CBD um, levels. You don't see anything else in it. Placebo is a red, little bit of a blip here, so maybe some contamination, but uh, not, not, not very substantial. All right, now this is a fairly busy slide line, but again, don't worry, I'll walk you through it. This is the uh, correlation to cannabinoid plasma levels. So looking first, what happened with the, in, in, with the CBD arm? And this is what we should be looking at, these correlation matrices. I'm going to focus on the things that, that are relevant. In. So CBD, there was basically no correlation whatsoever with anything, whether it's the MRBK or the box so across all levels of In the THC um, bar, you can see that with the THC and the hydroxyphenes, this is correlated these things correlate with each other. But anyhow, this is the potent hydroxy THC. And look, there was there was a negative, pretty significant negative correlations uh, with the MRVTRS, which is our primary uh, endpoint, with the PUTs and with the SUDs, meaning that the higher the hydroxy THC, the lower were all the symptoms. In the combo, it wasn't as much. You saw a little bit of hydroxy THC. But basically, the THC and metabolites correlated negatively. What about tolerability? Well, if we look at the total here uh, of different types of adverse effects of veins, we can see that all three have way more adverse effects compared to the placebo and red here. And you can also see that the THC had way more adverse effects compared to the others. Okay. And in particular, this was given by common. There's in a psychomotor slowing that time. Okay. So even though it was the most, uh, it had the most beneficial impact, it also had the most. Impact. What about the blinding? I, I, I described the study as a double blind trial. Well, um, the blinding was not very successful, meaning most people could correctly guess when they were asked after each treatment arm. Uh, in their opinion, what do they think they got? Most people got it. Uh, most people said when they got the placebo, most people said that they got placebo. And then with the CBD, most people said they got cannabis. placebo. Those that got the THC, well, they all got the THC. Got the THC. Everyone has the THC. Okay. So one of the limitations of your study, sample size. Small. This was a single dose trial. I don't know how things could change when people are taking uh, cannabis on an ongoing basis. And it was a fixed dose trial, meaning everyone got the same dose and the delivery was through inhalation. So they got the same dose. And I would say, in retrospect, this was a pretty generous dose. We talked on a group of patients that was mostly naive cannabis. No, 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 no uh, there was no adjustment for how well it's working or adverse effect, and, and no surprise that the blinding was. Not very successful. And again, I remind, keep reminding this is self populated So our next step, our hope is to, to do a chronic treatment cross over the next few years. Now it's not single dose anymore and oral based on, and now we're not interested in CBD anymore, it's specifically with a THC based oil with flexible dose. And so that can help to adjust things based on, on people's uh, benefits and adverse effects. And which should help with blinding and should help with recruitment too, because people not feel I have to be off cannabis the whole time. Um, and if this works out, uh, then I think the field it warrants a large multi-center parallel design study. But this, I would say, is my step. And we have a proposal currently being uh, evaluated by the DA to do such a study. All right, in practice. So in practice, coming back to the 
to the American Academy of Neurology and recommendations. So as I mentioned, it's a level C recommendation we may offer in patients who have been are treatment resistant, so have failed um, the other other, other treatments, uh, first line treatments, treatments for which we have some touched up yet, and who are or patients who are already using cannabis efficiently. Uh, you may offer medical cannabis, and but you must offer so level A recommendation either to, for anyone using medical cannabis wanting to use it must offer medical supervision either yourself or to direct them somewhere where they can get it. Must be using their lowest dose and periodically evaluate the need for it. That applies to all of our medication. And then the other thing in particular is you must counsel with regards to drug. So just reviewing the options. So what are the options here? What do we do? So in the beginning, I, when I was more hesitant and I was very more conservative in my approach to things, I pretty much always wanted to start with pharmaceuticals. Um, I have to say, I don't as much now. I still mention it and I offer it. But the reason I don't as much is because when patients have pretty significant things, they fail the main treatments. From experience and from the literature, I anticipate that cannabis itself is going to be but nevertheless, I still offer it and I still use it. So that is an option. And that varies based on where you are. So in Canada, dronabinol is no longer available. If it were available, I would be. Nabilone is a synthetic that I found. There's no direct evidence for this, but from experience, I found not as effective as dronabinol, but nevertheless, I do use it. Um, and, and, and it can help, but definitely it's helping patients. Now, Viximols, which is the spray, um, is very expensive. And I have to mention, actually, Kirsten has a study that I think is nearing the end, probably in the process of being analyzed at this point, an RCT with Nabixomol uh, specifically. That should be coming out soon, hopefully. And I would say cannabidiol does not, at this point, have a role in this. Um, we used to use more inhaled, and we always recommended vaporizing over smoking, although a lot of patients still preferred smoking. Um, but uh, now, and, and it was partly because this was the only thing available, but now that oral cannabis is available, this is preference. Inhaling is easier to titrate because they get the impact right away and they can adjust right away based on benefit and best based on adverse effects. Um, however, there are issues with inhaling. Uh, one is the risk to the lungs, uh, including from vaporizing. So vaporizing doesn't mean there's no, nothing bad happening to the lungs. Uh, but also, the effects don't last as long. They're much faster, but they don't last as long in general. There are exceptions to this, and rare exceptions that we've seen patients where they, they inhale and they really need to do it once or twice a day, and that's enough. So, but most of the time, it doesn't last as long. In contrast to oral cannabis, and here um, I've been using more at this point the oil. They're easier, easier to titrate. I use it like a medication, basically. I will take something without CBD in it, something like 10% THC, and those conservatively. Like say you take, if the patient has no experience with cannabis at all before, start low, go slow. Take, and it's those typically um, twice a day. Some people could be once a day just at that time, and some people three times a day. And you can adjust the dose you titrate and go up. Typically, I go up by about 0 0.1 mils a week. So I'd say let's take our time rather than overshoot, and then and then and then see how we can kind of adjust based on response. Caution. So always thinking about the harms. These things are like any medication. So you know, benign. Want to think how it's affecting them functionally. Um, and anyone with a history of cyclosporamia, I would not go there. I would recommend against it. Uh, caution about interaction. These. Um, they're, they're metabolized mainly by 2 c 9 and 3 4 and given the, that uh, 3 4 is a major metabolizer um, of THC and CBD, um, you need to talk about uh, uh, grapefruit. So if you're suddenly starting to use lots of, to lots of grapefruit, drink more grapefruit juice, it will affect the levels. Uh, caution against smoking. Um, uh, some patients still prefer it, but, uh, but uh, now that oral is available where I am, so that would be preferable. And then caution against driving. Uh, with driving things, this is a, a work in, this is an evolving situation. Um, uh, but uh, 
In Canada, it's purely by level. And even if you've been using it for years and you're completely habituated to it, it doesn't affect you at all in terms of psychomotor slowing. But if you get into an accident, even if it's not your fault and your levels are checked, it could be an issue. So you need to be cautious. And then certainly if someone who's starting at you, um, uh, can in fact drive you some caution around this. And then with legalities. So um, there's a lot of variation across jurisdictions. And even if someone were to just telling someone yesterday that uh, asking about travel, well, even if you go to Canada to a state um, in the US where it's legal, you cannot bring it with you. You have to cross federal borders and it's not legal federally. So in the US, so there's all sorts of, so traveling is a no no at this point uh, uh, with cannabis. So in conclusions, um, uh, in conclusion, so THC appears to be the one that is the main driver of anti tick effects. That's still a work in progress, but at this point, I think the evidence is really coming together to indicate that. But it is also the, 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 the main compound that uh, can result in, in harms, and that's something to be aware of. In contrast, CBD does not appear to have any uh, anti tick effect. Uh, caution is warranted as we, uh, as we do this. The evidence is still emerging. At the same time, uh, I think the field has benefited a lot through being open and uh, collaborating with patients as a whole, but also individually with any patient. It's, it's everything we do is about a collaborative relationship and the, the whole thing is in adults. So that is pretty much it. And I'm happy for us to have a Q&A and discussion. And I see there are a number of questions already, so I'll start going through them. And feel free to put questions in the Q&A as we go. So the first one is where can we find research reports on ticks and cannabis? I'd like to, I'd love to look more into this. Um, so research reports, uh, there is, in fact, the, the TAA a few years ago made, uh, has a statement on uh, medical cannabis for ticks. So that summarizes uh, where things were at, but this was, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, four years ago at this point. Uh, so there's been a lot of things since that. Well, you have access to these slides, so that's the latest evidence in these slides. And then also, so in, in one of the references in my slides, and the, there's a I, I mentioned Seiko review that reviews the evidence pretty well. I, I feel like it was published last year or the year before. Uh, next question: Is the reduction in symptoms only evidence when evident when someone is high? The answer is no. It is not only evident when someone is high. If this was the if this were the case, then it would not work for this treatment. Um, in some patients, I have to say, this is when it doesn't work, they are not able to get antibiotic effect without also getting cognitive effects, high or other things. So they do get antibiotic effects, but only when, uh, but, but only at doses where they're also getting the cognitive effects. And then in this case, it doesn't work. We don't get the separation. But in a lot of patients where it works is that they're getting anti-tick effects without getting any harm. Um, you are more likely to get high if you inhale it because you get a sudden peak. But even in such cases, the high passes after an hour or two, and then as it's going down, the anti-tick effect remains. And, and then certainly in oral, you have less likely chance of getting high. But in the end, it's really just a trial. You have to, it's, it's a trial to figure out. Next question, did any patient report problems with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome? So thank you for the question. This is something to be concerned about. That is something that can occur where you get uh, uncontrolled chronic uh, emesis, uh, vomiting uh, due to uh, uh, cannabis use. I've never seen it, uh, to be honest, and I've been using this for over 10 years in our clinic. Um, and I have not seen it in any of the reports. I think it's more of an issue in the context of cannabis abuse, but it is something to be aware of. So. Uh, but it's not something that we've seen. We've seen psychosis more than we haven't seen a ton of psychosis, but um, it's, uh, it is uh, uh, thankfully that even psychosis has been rare in our adult population, but not an existence, so it can happen. Um, but uh, hyperemesis syndrome is not something that we've seen at this point. Uh, as an adult, next question, as an adult with TS, how can we get in touch with the team about particip participating in a future trial? I would say um, depends where you are. I think really you would only be participate in a trial if there's a trial going on in your region right now. Probably that your best resource is the TAA to find out about this. Uh, at this point, these are all all the trials I've 
gone through or were done really just locally in their own jurisdictions. Um, in the future, if there is a large multi-sector trial, then there could be something. Like, but even then, it would be just the jurisdictions of the participating samples. That despite in Canada, it's surprising, despite it being legal regulation, so many candidates were red tape to do research with it is still a lot uh, and so it's not uh, it's not that easy so anyhow the best resource would probably be the TAA. well the other thing i would recommend is if you want to know if you're curious to find out more is a, a clinicaltrials.gov so it's one word clinicaltrials.gov and you can put in the search rats and cannabis this is like the registry for all clinical trials and you can see if there are any ongoing and actively recruiting clinical trials in the area where you want and then Oh, Kevin Black just sent a link to study the uh, the the uh, uh, efficacy of the Lubiximols results. Oh, when did this come out? Oh, I missed this. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> uh, so um, I somehow missed this. This came out in, uh, just a couple months ago, not even, and um, and I see that. Uh, uh, so this was, sorry, I mentioned an abiximol study by Kirsten uh, Mueller-Val. And I didn't mean this morning to double check that it hasn't been published yet, and I, I forgot to do that. So it looks like, uh, I'll just read out very quickly, the primary FST endpoint was defined as a thick reduction, uh, okay, uh, although, uh, of late, greater than 25% on the YGTSS total thick score, although a much larger number of patients than abiximols compared to the placebo, met the respondent criteria, superiority could not formally be demonstrated. Okay, so they it did not separate their primary FCC. This was despite the being, it's a 97 patients. Uh, and then there were trends in secondary analysis towards uh, improvement. So, okay, not particularly positive. Interesting, thank you very much, Kevin. So there you go, very fresh. Um, uh, how do we volunteer for future research? Uh, I would say contact the TAA about this. Uh, next question, uh, CBD oil, if I understand correctly, does not help ticks or tick attacks. That is correct. Uh, this is not something that we found from the evidence as CBD oil helping. If it helps, if it's placebo or whatever, fine, but it's not something that we've seen helping. What are the effects and research of, for CBD in children? Uh, it's only very specific to these rare forms of epilepsy, Lennox Gastos uh, and Dravet syndrome. Uh, so it's not, there's no studies whatsoever and no evidence whatsoever that CBD does anything for ticks of children. I would not expose children to, to CBD or any cannabis of this matter, but certainly there's no role for CBD. What is known about cannabis for anxiety disorders associated with Tourette syndrome? Thank you for this question. I'll just say very quickly, in the case series, all the case series, a common experience is, is people have experienced not just uh, improvement, not just in ticks, but a lot of comorbidities, uh, OCD, anxiety, and such. I would never use it specifically to treat anxiety at this point, but it's something that we've noticed. Uh, but I don't think we have enough evidence to speak very confidently, other than that from the case series, we see that often uh, people with where they're getting cannabis specifically for the ticks, often the anxiety goes down, whether it's an effect, direct effect of the cannabis or whether it's because of the ticks improving, hard to sort out at this point. Um, very informative, thank you. Any thoughts about including subgroup using treatment package THC and CBIT? Why not? I think at this point it's still too early, so we need to start with the basics, really sort out and uh, you know the effectiveness. But in the future, why not THC along with CBIT um, uh, if needed uh, and and supported by the evidence? Is there anything available for teens that may be effective? Not in the cannabis. Well, cannabis could be. You know, I mean. This is the thing, I'll, I'll confess that I have seen older teens with very severe ticks of failed multiple treatments where I've wondered about cannabis uh, recently. And so, but you have to be very, very careful. In fact, one particular patient, I told the patient and the family and the 17 year old with pretty severe ticks and failed everything. And I explained, I did raise it as an option and they declined. Is there anything, uh, then would CBD uh, oil THC free work uh, or has to have THC? Again, we see the interest in CBD. Thank you for these questions. It reflects the very intense interest in CBD. And I would say, again, not from the evidence, all the evidence 
whether it's the case series, the RCT, ours is the only RCT with, where we looked at CBD, there is no um, evidence of CBD oil for ticks specifically. Okay, so I'd be wary about this. So really it's the THC that is having that lactic effect. And it's no surprise there. In fact, when people started talking about this from experiences at parties, uh, well, those, uh, they, those uh, joints have no CBD, it's just THC. Uh, could you talk about how cannabis may affect correlation between fixed anxiety panic attacks? Has cannabis been shown to increase panic attacks in some? Yes, cannabis can, although in a lot of patients will report decreased anxiety, and cannabis can certainly worsen anxiety and cause a panic attack. So this is something that we see uh, outside of the threats world. A lot of people see it. Work on it. Patients with it. Say people will report increased anxiety panic attacks. Uh, is a research presentation just about the evidence for ticks? That's correct. Yeah, just focusing on ticks, not other disorder. Uh, although I said a few things about the others. What's the status of ticks um, after the initial effects of cannabis products wears off? Um, similar to hangover with alcohol? No, no, that's not the goal. The goal is to have anti tick effect without cognitive effects. And so the, hopefully, this is what we get clinically. Uh, just ticks or tick attacks? This question, no, it's ticks in general, tick, uh, not just tick attacks. Uh, what percentage of people with TS or UCC get high? Hard to say what percentage, it's a common side effect. Uh, and then we can see the link that you sent, the way to get access to that as well. I think you'd have to get it through the library or contact the authors to ask for a copy of the article. Where can you access your slides? The slides are available. I think we've covered most of the questions. There's comorbidity between ticks and OCD. Don't you see an increase in OCD symptoms, THC? No, I have to say the opposite. We tend to see OCD go down and same with other places. Um, so we are saying THC is helping us overall. It's a trial. Evidence is early. So it's something that can be tried. And, and then you, you'll see if it works for you or not. You just have to be cautious. Uh, different strains of weed. Well, the strains are unrecognizable at this point. They've been cross-bred through beyond recognition. So I'll just keep it simple, focus on. On, on the compound itself, which is THC. Um, Hi. Okay, we're done. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and let you answer one more question and then we'll have to end, please. Okay, so again, another question about CBD. It's clear CBD, there's no strong, strong there's, uh, I'll ask the la answer the last question, sorry. Any other medication taken in combination with THC to help a motivational aspect? I would be careful there. I would be very cautious about using one medication to treat the side effects of another. If there's a motivation, I think you need to play around with the cannabis as it's decreasing the dose, so hopefully for it to be a non-issue. No, I would be very wary. There's no evidence for doing any of that, and, and you want to be careful about not falling into a prescribing uh, chain. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for all for your attention and for all, for all these questions. Thank you all. Please take a second to um, look at the survey link in the chat. We really appreciate your feedback and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the TAA virtual conference. Have a great day.